Good morning, and want to welcome you here to worship at Roswell Presbyterian Church. We are so delighted that you are here worshiping with us today. Whether you are here in the sanctuary or watching via live stream, it's a good day to be together to worship. I want to make sure you know about some really important things coming up. Next Sunday is Palm Sunday. It's the beginning of Holy Week. We invite you to the service, but I also want to let you know that following the service, we will have a brief congregational meeting to vote on our new class of elders. If you want to know who those folks are, you can see this handout uh, in the narthex, and it tells you about all of those people. And so we'll have that congregational meeting next Sunday after this service. Also, after the congregational meeting, we have a luncheon to celebrate the retirement of Carmen Ebbing. And if you have been here for a minute, you know that Carmen is an amazing asset to our staff. She has been here for almost 28 years. So we're very excited to celebrate her and her journey into retirement. If you want to register for that lunch, you can register online. The registration does close tomorrow, so make sure that you do that. But as I said before, it is a wonderful day to be together in worship. Let's prepare our hearts and minds.
Friends, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I invite you to stand in body or in spirit for our opening hymn number 224, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. then we are lying to ourselves and the truth is not in us. But scripture also reminds us that when we confess to God where we have sinned, God will forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So with that on our minds and in our hearts, let us go to God in prayer using the prayer of confession found in your order of worship, followed by a time of silent personal confession. Lord, Grant that we may always be guided by you. Help us follow your plans rather than our own, that we might perfectly accomplish your holy will. Grant that in all things, great and small, today and all the days of our lives, we would do whatever it is you require of us. 
Help us to respond to even the slightest prompting of your grace so that we may be the trustworthy instrument of your honor. Forgive us for the ways we fall short and restore us. May your will be done in time and in eternity by us, in us, and through us. Amen. We are forgiven. Thanks be to God. It's my time to do the children's sermon. Is that right, Pastor Karen? Good morning. My name is Pastor Scott, and I'm one of the pastors here at the church, and I get to give the children's message today. I'm wondering if there are any children that would come forward, I've got a really important question I need to ask you, and I need some more advice. I can't... Hi, everybody. Nice to see you. Hi, Rosie. Tim. Hey, everybody. So some of you I know pretty well, and some of you I'm just getting to know. My name's Pastor Scott. Is there a something that you know about me what do most children know about me? john david i love gummy bears yes yeah. you got it what's one other thing i always like to wear caps i wear hats and i wear caps and i envy all the men who have so much beautiful hair but that's for another day so i have a question though do any of you have transformers no you're not transformers you do? Are they hard to transform? Yeah. Are they? They're kind of complicated sometimes? Because it looks like something and then you, you do this to it and then it looks like something totally different? Yeah. Do you know what? The Bible says that we are transformers. Did you know you're a transformer? What? You're a transformer. <laughs> you know why you're a transformer? Because the Bible says that when we give ourselves to God, when we love God with our body, mind, and soul, it transforms our mind. So sometimes we might be thinking of doing one thing, but then we remember, oh, I remember what the Bible says and what Jesus said, and so I'm going to do another thing. So what if someone called you a name, or called me a bad name, made fun of me? What would that feel like? I would feel sad. But you know what? That can be transformed if I remember, Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. I don't care what they think because I know that God loves me and created me just the way I am. So, have you ever been angry at anyone? Sometimes we get angry, don't we? Okay. Like, well, okay. <laughs> We're not giving examples today, so, but I'll give you an example. So, if someone bothered me a lot, inside I might feel like I wanted to punch them. But, you said do? No, don't punch. So, that's transformation because Jesus says that I'm supposed to not strike another person if they strike me. So, uh, that's why I learned to run really fast the other direction. So, we are transformers. So, you mentioned gummy bears. And you know, what do you know about gummy bears and me? Oh, I love them. What else? Rosie, can you remember? I'm trying to give them up. Right? And so... You try to give them up so you don't get sick from too much sugar. 
You're exactly right. But it was really hard for me. So I was telling Rosie about this last night, last week, because we're good friends now. And she went and got me a, a, it's a pamphlet in the North Ends that talks about addiction recovery. True <laughs> story. And in addiction recovery, you remember one day at a time I could get by without gummy bears. But I want to tell you something. Pastor Dan, when he went to New Zealand, he got me special kind of gummy bears that aren't like the normal gummy bears. They only make them in New Zealand. And they're all kinds of different shapes and sizes. And so if you come into the office and you have permission from your parents, you can eat these because I'm not. Okay, so remember <laughs> to let your mind be transformed by what Jesus says. May I, I'm going to pray for us. God, thank you for these beautiful children. Thank you for creating them in your image. They're so special. Help all of us, young and old, have our minds changed by you, by the word, by your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. See you later. Thank you. That's amazing. You know, one of those things that I, I took out of that is that that Dan brought brought you back something from New Zealand. <laughs> I, I didn't know that. I, I didn't get anything. But I'm going to be transformed. I'm going to pray about it. It's all good. As I said earlier, I'm so glad that we are all here together. We want to know that you are here today. We have our friendship registers. Those are the black folders nearest the center aisle. If you would take those, if you would let us know that you're here. Write your name down. If you're visiting with us, we're especially glad you're here this morning. And we would love to have an email address or a phone number so that we can be in touch with you about all that is going on in the life of this church. And we can share our gummy bears with you. We do all the things here. I do want to make sure, see, and everybody's excited about that. I do want to make sure you see the red rose on the pulpit this morning. We did announce this last week in here, but I want to make sure if you missed it, that you know that our director of membership, Morgan Burge, had her baby, uh, baby girl. So please be in prayer for their family as they expand it. We're so thrilled for them. We've also had our men's retreat this weekend, so be in prayer for those folks traveling back from that. Lots of good stuff going on. But we know that when we come together as church family, we come together to celebrate our joys and the exciting things that are happening. But we also know that we come to bear one another's burdens. We come to pray together before the Lord and share all that we have on our minds and on our hearts. It's so good to pray together. So the Lord be with you and also with you. Let us pray. Holy and gracious God, we do thank you for the opportunity to worship this morning. God, the fact that, that you have woken us up and given us this day. Help us to not take this day or this time for granted. God, this time is a gift. It's a gift to be able to be here, to worship you. God, to be with church family. God, to experience your love in a real way. And God, we do know that you are indeed here with us. Help us to rest in your presence. Help us to know deeply your peace that surpasses our understanding, no matter what may be going on in our lives. And God, for those things that are going on in our lives that feel hard or dark, the places that are broken, God, we lift them to you. God, we know that you are a big God you're with us all and you hear all of our prayers and most of all, you are at work. There is not a time or a space or a place that you are not at work. So help us to cling to that truth and find hope in it. And Lord, we lift up our world, all of the places that, that are hurting, that are experiencing injustice and warfare and brokenness. God, help us to be people 
that you can use to bring the good news of your love and mercy and grace into this broken world. Help us to be instruments of peace and vessels of love. Help us to sow unity instead of discord, love instead of hatred. Again, always pointing to you for your glory. And we pray all of this in the way that your son Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning. It's great to be with you this morning. It's always a little bit awkward when you're preaching, coming partway through a service, and then this morning to realize I'm in trouble already and I wasn't even here. <laughs> I, I didn't do it. Well, apparently I did. Thanks, Scott. <laughs> it was our secret. <laughs> Not anymore. <laughs> Guess I'll have to go back and bring something back to you. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> past several weeks, over this Lenten period, we have been looking at prayers we pray, significant prayers in the life of Christianity and the Christian faith, prayers that have stood the test of time. Today, Jeff has chosen the prayer of service written by St. Teresa of Avila. And the scripture chosen for today, for today comes from the book of Romans, Paul's letter to the church in Rome, beginning at chapter 12. But before we read scripture, let us once again turn to God in prayer. Let us pray together. God, we give you thanks for your word, for the examples of those who have gone before us. We pray as we read, as we seek to understand your word, that it will penetrate, pierce our hearts transform and shape us that we will be equipped to serve you as you have called. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So again, Romans chapter 12, beginning at the first verse. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not be conformed to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. Then you'll be able to test and, and prove what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I am not enough. You may be looking and shaking your heads like, you're right. I'm not enough. I mean, I, I see it all the time. Our, our world now is inundated with social media posts on Facebook and Instagram. And I see the lives of people are leading. Some lives, some of the people in this very room, and I see the traveling that you're doing, the concerts you're attending, and the amazing family connections that you're having. And I look at my life and I'm like, I am so bored. My life is so ordinary and mundane. Now, Scott just highlighted that, yeah, recently my wife and I were traveling. And I've had many of you ask about our trip. And so you might see those things posted of the friends that, with whom we reconnected and time with our children and all that kind of stuff and think the same thing. You're looking at all those things that I've put, not, put out there and think, wouldn't that be nice? What we tend to do, what we end up doing 
is we look at the highlights of others' lives and then compare the highlights with just our everyday ordinary lives, with our shopping and our grocery and our making dinner lives, and we think, ah, I'm so bored. My life is kind of mundane. I, I really don't measure up. Wouldn't it be nice to live those lives? Over the past several weeks, again, we've been looking at the prayers we pray. Jeff has chosen several significant prayers. Prayers that have stood the test of time, that have had significant impact on the Christian community for years, for generations. And we've looked at the people who wrote these prayers. Towering figures in the Christian faith. People like Niebuhr, or St. Francis of Assisi, St. Patrick of Ireland, which really should have been today. I mean, come on. <laughs> and then St. Teresa of Avila, today. And I know that this was not Jeff's intent. Jeff did not intend to have this sermon series be another reflection, another demonstration of our weakness. Here's another area that you don't measure up. your spiritual life. It can be very heartbreaking, very disconcerting when we come to think about or understand, believe that we don't measure up. Those thoughts can come about various times in our lives for a number of reasons. It's possible that we may have experienced a job loss, and it was difficult to find something else that was meaningful, that was engaging, that was seen as purposeful, as valuable. So we thought, I really don't measure up. Perhaps, perhaps we had some sort of fractured relationship. Maybe we've gone through a divorce or something like that. And the pain and the anguish, whatever that was in that relationship, led us to think for a period of time, I guess I'm not enough. Maybe we had dreams or ambitions of some sort to achieve something, to do something, to accomplish something, and for whatever reason, those things did not materialize. It didn't happen. And we look at that and think of those dreams and, again, we might be left with the feeling that, I guess, I guess I'm not as equipped, I'm not as skilled, I'm not as able as I had hoped. So we recognize that as we study these prayers and these people, particularly when we look at their highlights, which is what we, that's what we focus on or concentrate on, it seems like here's another way. I mean, I know, again, Jeff did not intend for us to feel this way, but to be honest, I have found myself periodically over the course of the last several weeks thinking, wow, my, my life is so far removed from their experience, from what they went through. They were so holy and godly and lived such sacrificial lives. And, and their, their connections and their understanding of God not only transformed them, but transformed those around them and has repercussions or ramifications till now, decades, generations later. My life pales in comparison to that. I mean, we even call these people saints. They're saints. That says something, right? That's significant. But let me assure you that they were not saints in their own time. They did not see themselves as saints. These men and women struggled mightily. They had huge doubts and questions about their faith, about God, about God's purpose for their lives. 
The we reason we remember them is because they struggled through them and wrote of them and for some came out the other side and said, this is what I've learned. So hopefully today, as we look a little bit at the life of St. Teresa of Avila, and we open the door a little bit to her life, we'll understand that our lives are just as valued and sacred to God as were all of theirs. So the prayer today, the prayer of service, that Jeff chose, again, written by St. Teresa of Avila, and it says this, Govern everything by your wisdom, Lord, so that my soul may always be serving you in the way that you will, not as I choose. Let me die to myself so that I may serve you. And may you live as to you who are life itself. St. Teresa of Avila was born in 1515 in Spain. She was born to a very loving and close family of some means. She was not impoverished as a child. So again, we may be led to believe that because there's so much distance geographically and in time between our lives and hers, she must have been this huge presence. That she had this deep and amazing relationship with God, that she lived such a sacrificial and holy life. That is why we remember her. But in my planning and research and study for this message, what I've come to see, what I've come to appreciate about her is her candor and her honesty. The openness, the way that she exposed herself to others in regard to her struggles and her questions and her doubts. And the wisdom that she gleaned through those periods. The story that resonated most with me and kind of humanized her for me was one that occurred later in her life. She had committed herself to become a nun. And she began to establish convents around Spain. And she was traveling around these convents to encourage the sisters that lived there. And I don't no idea what time of year it was, but the weather was bad. And it was days of travel. It was cold and damp, raining, miserable. The roads weren't great. It was muddy. It was getting, her cart was getting stuck all the time. And she was complaining. It says for days on end, for however long this journey was to God, God, why are you doing this to me? God, can, can we see a little bit of sunshine? God, why is my cart stuck again? She hated it, and it was God's fault. God eventually responded and said, Ah, Teresa, Teresa, I always treat my friends this way. To which she is said to have responded, Well, that explains why you have so few of them. <laughs> she felt a calling to join a convent but she had such a close relationship particularly with her father but with her family and that caused great anguish and strife in her life she didn't want to separate herself from them she knew what she was supposed to do, but she didn't, she didn't want to distance herself from her family, who she loved so much. She says this about that time. She says, I had no love of God strong enough to subdue my love for my family. Everything was such a strain to me that if the Lord had not helped me, no reflections, no thoughts, no motivation of my own, would have sufficed to keep me true to my purpose. So she commits herself. She eventually separates from her family and becomes a nun. And she there decides, I want to be a woman of prayer. 
I'm going to dedicate myself to prayer so that I can deepen my relationship with God and understand who God is and what God desires for me. And she says, for nearly 20 years, I prayed earnestly and struggled in prayer. I, she said, even after all that time, she said, I never felt that I fully understood what it meant to love and serve God. Can you imagine dedicating yourself to prayer and over a period of 20 years still feeling that struggle? She says at that time, I suffered in this conflict in prayer between my friendship with God and my friendship with the world. She also recognized a tendency in herself to overthink things. You might have already kind of figured that out. She thinks a lot. She overthought who she was and what God wanted of her. And her, her mind, it seemed, never shut down. Am I doing it right? Is this what God wants from me? God, I, I don't feel close to you. What, what is happening? As she worked through that, one, she recognized her tendency to overthink, and then she began to understand what that meant. And this is what she says about her overthinking. The important thing is not to think too much, but to love much. Do then whatever arouses you to love. For love consists not in the extent of your own happiness, but in the firmness of our determination to please God in everything. She understood that my mind is racing, that it's so full, that I'm constantly thinking about what is right and how am I supposed to live. Stop. Let me love. Start there. She also experienced times where she felt great distance between herself and God. Much like many of us probably have at times. And these periods would go on for a significant length of time. There was some kind of chasm between her and God, and there was something blocking her relationship, and she didn't understand. She wasn't hearing from God, and it frustrated her, and it caused anxiety. And again, her mind is spinning, trying to figure out, what am I doing wrong? How do I connect? What is it that you want from me, God? She came to conclude this about where God was in those times where she felt distant. It is erroneous to think that we must leave ourselves and journey somewhere distant in order to find God. God is already accessible to us and it is up to us to continue to speak to God. However softly we speak, God is near enough to hear us. She also saw that there were many people looking at her and her life as some kind of example. People saw her devout demeanor. They saw the work that she was doing, the prayer that she was pursuing, and they began to lift her up as something special and unique. And she was very uncomfortable with that. Again, because she understood that what people were seeing were the highlights, the outer stuff. They are not hearing or understanding the conflict that was going on within her. And she struggled to come to terms with the purpose of her soul, to understand what, what has God given me in this? What is my soul? How is God molding and shaping me through this? And she, shows, she says this, she comes to terms with what her soul is and the purpose of her spiritual life. The only things that a soul has to offer God are its own poverty and its desire for God. 
She recognized that her soul, in and of itself, that there was nothing that she could generate within there that she could offer to God. It's just, I just have poverty. The only thing that I have is my desire, God, for you. That's what my soul is. She goes on to say, everything a person possesses, whether talents, intellect, strength, or goodness, all of those are gifts from God. And they're given for the soul to use to glorify God. Isn't that powerful? That all that we have, all that we are, particularly in regard to our spiritual lives, are gifts from God given to us, why? So that we are more able to glorify God with our lives. That's the purpose. And in regard to her life as an example, people looking to her and saying, oh, this is how you're to live. She says, my personal failings, they're offered as warnings for others. And any success is a testimony to the mercy of God at work in me. Ultimately, St. Teresa came to understand that her best self was found in those rare moments, those infrequent moments, when she was able to give herself fully and solely to God. And she recognized it did not happen all the time. That those were hard-won moments. But the prayer that we read today, the one that Jeff chose for us to study, comes out of that experience. Govern everything by your wisdom, Lord, so that my soul may always be serving you in the way that you will, and not as I choose. Let me die to myself so that I may serve you, and let me live as to you who are life itself. So saints, we are not. Well, at least I'm not. But we need not concern ourselves about that. Don't get hung up in that fact. St. Teresa's example to us is one that says, be willing to be honest with ourselves about who we are and the struggles that we have. But live each day. Give our utmost to give ourselves to God today. Today. And then wake up tomorrow and let's strive to do that again. And it's those times, it's those moments when God's wisdom will cover everything. And our lives will truly be serviced in. Amen. Amen. One of the ways we can give ourselves to God today, this day, is by being here in worship. Those who are listening online, you're here with us. It's a way you're giving yourself to God as well. And the way we give ourselves to God in worship is through the giving of our tithes and our offerings. Many of you prefer to give online, but some of you prefer to give when the tray is passed down the pew and back and forth. I invite our ushers to come forward and receive our morning offering. And as I do, let us thank you for the extraordinary generosity of God toward us in Christ. And may we be generous to the work of God.
As always, it has been great to worship with you. Just a reminder that next week at this time, we'll be having a congregational meeting to elect the elders for the next class. And also, after that meeting, there's a farewell banquet function to celebrate the life, ministry, and work of Carmen Ebbing, who's retiring. So please go ahead and register for that. We would love to show her how much she has meant to this congregation and just thank her for all her work. Sometimes when we're singing hymns that are unfamiliar to us, we're struggling just to kind of get there and understand what's going on. I want you to remind you again, verse 2 of the hymn we just sung connects to what it is that we're to understand. Listen to these words once again. We give our minds to understand your ways. We give our hands, eyes, and voice to serve your great design. And we give our hearts with the flame of your own love ablaze. You are enough. You are enough because God has imbued each of you, each of us, with all that is required to love and serve God. So go this day, focusing on giving ourselves fully today, and then wake up tomorrow and strive to do it again. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with all of us now and forever. Amen. Mm -hmm.